Well, I've lost my... Oh, here we are. That's better. Mm -mm. Might be when nobody comes. I'll wait a few minutes. Hello. Hi. That's grand. All right, lovely. I don't know why, but it's not muting people as they come in. It's very strange. I don't know what's going on here. No, it normally it normally mutes you when you come in. I know, and it's not doing it. It's very weird. It did, did it do it. Not? It did? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. Okay, very good. All right. So what would I want it to do here? A minute. Participants. No. Oh, there you go. Yes. Okay, so I've muted everybody and um, we'll wave. And... Um, <laughs> we'll mute everybody and then we'll um you can unmute ask questions and stuff okay as usual that's grand okay now then we're going to start off uh my i want my prayer here's our prayer oh zoom I find Zoom so tricky. I really do. I don't know why it's more tricky for me than the other ones. Oh, good. We've done it. Hooray. Okay, so let's start off with our prayer. I absolutely want to pray that God should come after, after the... What's going on now? What? Oh gosh, hold on a second. One second, stop. I have it in front of me, Yadida. Oh no, what's it going was on? there. The prayer was there before and share. All right, so just to say hello. That's it, sorry. I was making a video of, of one of the meetings I'd done and it suddenly started playing. Okay, right. Uh, stop. Okay. Okay, that should be all right now. Okay. Computers work fine until they suddenly get ideas into their heads. Right. Okay, start again. So I really want to pray that our learning should be for the merit of the soldiers in Aza and those who are in Yehuda and Shomron and those who are on the north. And God should look after all of them wherever they are. And that Hashem should really take care of the hostages and bring them from darkness into light very quickly. Amen. All right, a refor shalema to the wounded. All right, ribon olamim v'dana adonim, av rachaman v'slichot, v'odim anachnu lefanecha adonai loheinu v'leavotainu, v'kida b'shta havaya shekarovtonu l'toratcha u'lavodotcha v'dat ha'kodesh, 
ונתת לנו חלק בסודות תותח הקדושה. מה אנו ומה חיינו אשר עשית עמנו חסד גדול כזה, על כן אנחנו מפילים תחנוננו לפניך, שתמחו ותסלח לכל חטאותינו ועוונותינו, ועל יהיו עוונותינו מבדילים בינינו לביניך, וכן יועצון מלפניך, אדוני אלוהינו ולאבותינו, שתכונן את לבבינו לבעתך ולבעתך, ותקשיב אוזניך לדברינו אלה, ותפתח לבבינו הערל בסודות תורתך, ויהיה לימודנו זה נחת רוח, לפני כיסא כבודך כרך ניחוח, ותאציל עלינו, או מקור נשמתנו בכל בחינתנו, שהתנוצצו ניצוצות עבודיך הקדושים, אשר על ידם גלית את דבריך אלה בעולם, וזכותם, וזכות אבותם, וזכות תורתם וצמינותם וקדושתם, יעמוד לנו לבל ניכשל בדברים אלו. ובזכותם תראיננו במה שאנו לומדים, כמאמר נעים זמירות ישראל, גל עיניי ואביטה נפלאות מתורתך, כי אדוני יתן חוכמה מפיו דעת ותבונה, יהיו לראות צונים רפי, ויגון ליבי לפניך, אדוני צורי וגורלי. אמן, כן יהיו עוד צון. Yeah, good, it's recording. That's okay. For some reason, I haven't been able to put it onto YouTube lately. So we'll record it, and then hopefully I'll be able to up upload it afterwards. All right, then. Now we've got a really, really interesting um, piece today. It's a letter from Rabbi Ashlag. I'm awfully sorry about the quality of the scanning. I, I did the, the book itself is yellow page, okay? And it's a very thick book, and it's very difficult to open it in such a way that it will actually um, scan properly. So the quality is really dreadful, all right? And I did it page by page. So I'm going to have to sort of like open each page separately, all right? But anyhow, this is a letter Rabbi Hudalev Ashlag wrote to his students. And he wrote it, um, I think it must have been in 1925. He'd come already to Israel from Poland. Sorry, indeed, uh, we haven't, we've still got the... Um, oh, you've got the pair? The, okay, sorry, thanks. We haven't got that file share yet. I apologise. Thank you so much for telling me, Nicole. Great. Okay, that do it? Yeah. Okay, you can see it's pretty, it's pretty typical. It's not very good to quality scan. All right. Um... So, yeah, so Rabbi um, Ashlag had come on Aliyah and unfortunately had to leave some of the children behind because he didn't have enough money to bring them all with together. They'd been left with relatives and two of the children had died whilst they, you know, before he could go back and get them. Very sad. And um, anyhow, he went back, I think it might have been in 1923 or 25, I don't remember. He went back to Warsaw um, to pick up the other children and to um, also revisit his rabbis whilst he was there. And also whilst he was there, he gave tremendous warnings to um, the Jews in Europe to leave Europe. He absolutely said, you have to leave Europe and they, they didn't listen. It's very sad. Anyhow. Um, so this is a, a letter that he wrote whilst he was away to his students who were still, who were back in Israel, who were, who, who were his students in Israel, okay? And it's for um, Parshat Shemot, so it's exactly right for us. And he writes like this, L'chvod b'nei yeshiva d'atur rabanim, Hashem alehim, if you, amen. To the, to my dear, uh, students of the uh, Beit Midrash, may God look after you. God be upon you. It's Ta'em od Alevarim Hamdudalim. I'm very sorry about certain of the students whose connection with our group is not so strong. And for external reasons, um, they external reasons have sort of overcome them and have stopped them joining with you. May God oh, oh, give them strength and enable them to join with us again 
and God be with them. And I understand that you're not practicing so much the union of the mind. Now, the correction of the mind is faith. The mind, the will to receive of the mind, the exhale of the mind is that we want to know everything. We want to be able to categorize everything. We want to be able to control with our minds what's going to happen and what's going to be. And, you know, we that's what we want. We want certainty. And that is a will to receive for ourselves alone. And the Torah teaches us that the way to overcome that, the way to go against that, the way of giving, okay, is faith. All right? So the, the, the unity of, the, of faith for the mind and the heart, the, the will to receive of the heart is the will to receive sensuality. We all want to feel good, okay? We all want to, that's the wheel of the heart. And the tikkun of that, the rectification of that is by giving to the other, okay? That's giving to the others, the rectification of the heart. So Rabbi Ashag says, and he's speaking to his students, um, I don't think that you're practicing as much the union of faith with giving unconditionally as I would desire. Nevertheless, do the best you can, and the salvation of God is in the twinkling of an eye. And the most important issue that's standing before you is the union of the companions, that we need to be one. All over Israel today, everywhere you go, we're talking about biyachad, achdut, unity. All right, everywhere you go, we go on, you go on the bus and it reminds you to, you know, put your ticket onto the machine to pay. And then he says another message, kulanu biyachad, we're all together. All right, because we've learned from the awfulness of the previous year that we cannot stay separate. We have to be together. We have to unite. And uni unity is not easy. Unity requires giving up, it requires giving, okay, because we're all different, and we've all got different views, and we're all our different views uh, pulling in different directions, okay? So to come to unity is a tremendous giving. So Rabbi Ashlag, in, I would say 90% of all the letters that he wrote to his students emphasized unity amongst them, all right? And he says, make a tremendous effort in this because this has the power to deal with any other lacks that we have. Just unity, just working on unity helps us deal with anything else. Now he goes into the issue of exile, all right? Ita. It's written in the Gemara. Talmid Shigala Megalin Rabo Imo. And he starts off with a very interesting uh, idea here. It's from the Gemara, and the Gemara is talking about um, what happens with a, a somebody who has accidentally uh, killed somebody else. Okay? You know, there's a rule if somebody accidentally kill somebody else, it's called manslaughter. And a man, uh, somebody who's committed that has to go to a city of refuge, all right? And live there until the high priest dies. So Talmud Shigala, now he's talking about a Talmud Shigala, a Talmud Chacham, all right? A student of a great Rav who is exiled, his, his rabbi is exiled with him. Okay, that's the rule in the Gemara. Explanation. What does this rule mean? It was very difficult for the rabbis, this whole concept, that a Talmud Chacham should fall so low that he should even accidentally kill, kill somebody. And it says, how is this matter possible that... The, the negative forces 
should have a, sort of controlled him in his Torah and in the work of the Talmud, that he should be thrown out from the inheritance of God, okay, after he was once connected with the true Rav. Okay? And on this they gave the answer. Because when the Talmud was falling down in his spiritual work, it appeared to him as if his rabbi was also not so great as he thought he was. He's like he's lost his estimation of the sage. And since that's what he thinks, that's what actually comes to be. In other words, he's no longer able to gain wisdom from the sage except according to how he rates the sage in his heart. And if he just rates the sage in his heart as a, somebody who's not so great, he's a bit lowly, he's not, uh, he's not really worth listening to, then he stops listening to him. And what actually happens in the measure that he measures his sage, therefore, his, in his heart, his rabbi is exiled with him as well. Okay? That is to say that when he's looking at his sage in a lowly way, then the form of his sage is also an exile. Okay? Why is this thing... This black bar interfering with what I can see. Oh, I say I can put it out of the way. Well, that's better. That's a much better idea. All right. And, okay. Now, what Rabbi Ashag is hinting here is that the sage himself is perfectly okay. All right. Nothing's happened to the sage. All right. He's actually fine. But it's the way the, the Talmud, the way the student is valuing him now is lowly. And therefore, in fact, he appears to him to be lowly and he can't learn anything from him. So that's one example. Now he's going to look at what happened in Egypt. All right. That the beginning of the exile of Egypt and the servitude begins from the scripture, Vayakom melech hadash al Mitzrayim, asher lo yadat Yosef. And a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. Peirush. What does this mean? And again, Rabbi Ashlag takes it from the inner, okay? What actually happened was the... A, a, Appeared a new governance of their will to receive in the mind of every single one of them, okay, of the children of Israel he's talking about, okay, that they no longer rated Joseph. This is what he says. They fell down. The children of Israel fell down from their previous high spiritual level in the same way that a student who is exiled, his rabbi is exiled with him, and they no longer recognize Joseph as being the great tzaddik. That is to say, they only now attained him in the way that they measured him in their heart. That is, in a more lowly and lower way. They, in fact, they imagined in their heart to not Yosef, an image of Joseph, as they were themselves. The Kevan Shechen, and since that was the case, Lo Yaduit Yosef, they didn't know Joseph anymore. They weren't connected with him. They weren't able to look up to him as the tzaddik. And that's why the servitude began. Okay? Because she'im lo kain. Because if that was not the case, vadai hayat tzaddik magen alehim. Of course the tzaddik would have been uh, sheltering for them. 
ולא הייתה מצוירת להם כלל בחינת גלות ושיבוד. It would not have been possible for them to be in exile and be in servitude. That's amazing. That is amazing. In other words, they had lost their high understanding of Joseph. This piece actually that they that they no longer understood Yosef or attained Yosef as being the tzaddik, and that's why the exile began is actually in the Zohar. I found it by accident the other day. I mean, it's not by accident. Hashem gave it to me to see it. That's where Rabbi Ashag's bringing this from. In other words, everything that's happened in the story is happening in us. All right? It's, it's, it's not about history. It's about when we get into exile, our exile. What's exile mean? Okay? The word galut. I'm going to put this in the chat. 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 There we go. Okay. So... A minute. If I write in Hebrew, galut. Okay, galut. Another word for galut is gola. All right. Okay, that is exile. All right. It's exactly the same word as. Sorry. Bula. Okay, what's the one letter different? The Aleph. Rabbi Ashlag teaches us that the difference between exile and redemption is only one letter, and that is connection with the uh, with the Aleph, connection with the One of the World, connection with the with with the Hashem. That's the that's the one difference between exile and redemption. Okay. Now, the tzaddik, a true tzaddik, okay, a true tzaddik is like a stepping stone to Hashem, okay. And Rabbi Ashlag writes, faith in the sages is like a springboard to emunah Hashem, okay, faith in in God. Why? Because Yosef was was the like the the. The, the Yesod, he was the bringing forth the, the order Chochmah, the light of Chochmah of the Torah. Okay? Okay, he was the closest to, to Yaakov and he was bringing forth the light of the Torah. And so, so long as they absolutely revered the Torah that Yosef was bringing them, the, then the, the, the slavery couldn't touch them. Okay, slavery is galut. It's 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 disconnection from the one. That's what the slavery was. However, when Yosef, um, uh, 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 the the memory of Yosef, the teachings of Yosef were no longer valued by them, then they were then they left Gula and they were into galut. All right. Okay. Any questions? Anybody got a question? Just unmute yourselves and call out. Okay. All right. All right, then we'll carry on. Mufurash. And it's explicit that the shibud, okay, that the servitude was with bricks, a chomer, well, cement probably, and bricks, chomer bilvenim, cement and bricks, okay? And again, Rabbi Ashlag takes us on the inner, okay? Chomer, 
אוקיי, אוסו כמין עוון החמור שדנין בזה למחשבה. Now, this is, he says, this is the severe or the serious sin which children of Israel are judged in their thought, okay? Now, in general, okay, a person is not judged by his negative thoughts, okay? He's judged by his negative actions, all right? If you go into a shop and you have, God forbid, a thought to steal something and you do tshuva on the spot, and you don't, you're not judged for it. You're not judged for negative thoughts. You're only judged if you actually take the thing and put it in your basket, okay? That would be, that would be a, 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 a negative action. But if you, do, if you have a, a negative thought, or God forbid a negative thought of Lashon Hara, and you bite it back and you don't do it, not only do you're not punished for that, but you probably get a reward for, for, for withholding neg something negative, okay? So if you have a negative thought, we are not judged on that, okay? Except for one. And that is Avodazara, worshipping foreign things, uh, 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 idol worship, all right? But idol worship can actually mean worshipping yourself. All right? That's also idol worship. When we put ourselves completely before God, if we're working, worshipping, like serving our will to receive for ourselves alone, our egoism, instead of serving the Creator, that's the Avon Hamu. Okay, so that is actually, we're judged for that in our thought, in our heart, okay? So even if it does, we don't actually bring it out, that's, we, it, 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 it's considered a sin, all right? Ubilvenim, bilvenim is the bricks, but it's also got hidden in there, you can see the word lavan, all right, which means white. So what's the white? Is the tshuva, okay? They did tshuva on it. And they merited to God's mercy. And they attained for the moment the highest light. Because of their faith in their holy fathers. And they were cleansed, like, you know, whitened from their iniquities. But they couldn't keep it up. And they kept going forwards and back and forwards and back over and over, backwards and forwards. And they, because of this, they went through all the work of the field. What's the field of consciousness? The continuation of this hard work. Oh, no, one second. Awfully sorry. I just have to open the next page um, of this. Oh, where was now? One second. It's, uh, it was the Pharaoh letter. That's right. Pharaoh. Or Pichacham or something I called it. Here we are. Good. Now I need page two. Oh, that came up much better, didn't it? So they went through all the all all the let me just get that last bit, all the rest of the um mitzvot. Okay, except for that of Avodazara. Kamosha and Muzikonamli Vaha. As the sages of blessed memory said, Benoniim Zevaze Shoftan. Okay? In other words, they kept going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Is this or can you see this new new page? Or do I have to reshare it or something? Anyhow, 
Well, I hope it's okay. If I can it's... see it. It's a page that's much whiter than the other one. Yeah, I know. I don't know how I did that. Okay. It's got pre kaham on the top. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thanks, Nicole. All right. So Thank anyhow, you. they kept... Thank you. So they kept going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. All right. One moment they were connecting with God. The next moment they'd fallen down and they were back with their will to receive themselves ago again. And then they felt the suffering from that because they felt the exile from that. And then they would do again, do tshuva and get stick with their will and come back to the will to give. And this whole time of forwards and backwards is called the klipa of Pharaoh, the paro. And that's from the letters Pera, the malchut, because the per, the 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 uh, svirot, the uh, the svirot can also be mapped onto the face. Okay, and the I'll just quickly tell you the forehead is is keter, the eyes are hochma, the orbits of the eyes are the first part of bina, the ears is the last part of bina, tiferet is the nose, and the mouth is malchut. So pera can be thought of as malchut, pear is the mouth, okay? But ra, okay? It's evil, all right? Okay. And how does it explain, Rabbi Ashlag explain pera, pharaoh, as being the malchut? And he says like that. The malchut of the um, um, face is called pear, which we just said, the mouth. And what it means is, is that a person needs to make a decision and that is that his word, what he says, is sacred. That what he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Okay? So if he decides to throw away his avodazalah and go after God. He needs to actually do it in practice. But what happened in exile of Egypt was they were under the influence of this pera, this bad malchut, okay? And they couldn't actually follow through, all right? In other words, they would make up their minds they were going to do something positive, all right? that what would come out of their mouth would be one reality and what would actually happen in practice would be another reality. Okay, and I think, honestly, I can I can certainly see this in myself, you know, I, that, that I can see this as a reality of, of exile, which is present in the present. I don't have to go back to Egypt to, to, to discover this. It's, it's, you know, it's, it, it's an hour that we all can do that. We sort of think that we're going to uh, make a decision, stick to something, and we find we can't. So what he says is, even though they merited, because they were the children of Israel, and they did have the Sukkot Avot, to some higher light, okay, from the higher Sviot, when they made a decision, they really wanted to do tshuva, they couldn't bring it out in practice, okay? They couldn't actually stand up in practice against the will to receive for themselves alone, and they would choose that instead of choosing God. Because this para, this pharaoh, was opposite the Per Tikdusha, the Malchut Shamayim. So you've got these two governances, all right? The Pharaoh within and the Malchut Shamayim, all right? And in truth, they usually are balanced to, to, in order to give us free choice, but it's very difficult. And the what would happen is the Pera, okay, is the neck, all right? So you've got the mind. The mind wants to go back into tshuva. He knows, he knows, he knows the suffering which is caused by his exile from his uh, the connection with, the, with, with God, all right? And, but he can't get it from the mind 
to the action, into the body. Just can't. And if you look at the word orif, okay, the neck, it's the it's the pharaoh. It's exactly the same word. All right. Pei, Reish, Vav, Ein, Hey. Pharaoh. Has Pharaoh got a hay in it? Can't remember. Yes, he has. All right, there you go. It's exactly that. So it's like we've got this block, all right, between the neck, between the head and the body. And it's stopping that flow of energy, that flow of goodness, that flow of, yes, this is what I want, actually activating the body and acting from that. So this is stopping the bounty coming down from the head and he's taking away all their bounty, which had become to, to come down for Israel and the Pharaoh, the world to receive for itself alone, is taking it for himself. Okay? And this is the inner meaning of that there was no slave could ever escape Egypt. Because Pharaoh made a tremendous uh, witchcraft on the doorways of Egypt, as the sages have said. And he'd sort of got control, the, the, the control, that means the control of the will to receive for itself alone had become so strong that a person was not able to get out of it. I mean, I'll give you an example that I remember. When I was um, a young uh, med medical, uh, I just qualified and we had to do, you know, what they call stage or registration or whatever it calls it in different places. And um, I was on a ward I used to look after them at night where uh, uh, people had been um, terrible, terrible heavy smokers. It was in London. Very, very, very heavy smokers to the extent that they had caused um, the, the constriction of the blood vessels of their legs or of their arms so badly that they needed amputation. It was that bad. It was awful. And these people would be crying at night from the pain they were in because they no blood was going to their limbs. It was terrible. And yet they would all go out to the balcony and sit and smoke their cigarettes. That was crazy. All right. They knew what they were doing to themselves and they could not stop it. All right. And that is the power of the Pharaoh. That is the power of the will to receive oneself alone. That even when a person knows and he's trying with all his strength to get out of this addiction, all right, and our will to receive for ourself alone can be addictive in many, many, many different ways, he couldn't get out of it, all right? And this sort of like, this is what uh, the, the sages describe as Pharaoh was a kind of magician who had put magic on the uh, doorways of Egypt, okay? And what's the doorway? The doorway is the idea of I want to do tshuva, I want to change. As the sages said, pitchuli petach kokodosh machat, open to me a doorway like the point of a needle. And now we can understand what it says. Because I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go with, uh, without a strong hand. Peush, explanation. That God announced through Moses, his servant. Who's Moses? The, okay, Moses in the historical sense, but also Moses is the aspect of emunah, okay, of faith in the person. Do you remember what, what Rabbi Asher told his, his students to have to strengthen in? He said, you've got to strengthen your faith, all right? 
that God told, tells the aspect of faith in the in the in the person that no yad chazaka, no strong hand or power in the world is of any use against this evil klipa, this evil power, because it only uh, uh, um, can be conquered by God Himself in His glory and Himself. Like we, when what happens when we are stuck with the klipa of paro, when we know what we want to do, we know what's right, we're trying with all our heart to do tshuva, and this paro won't let us, okay, then what we have to do 100% is call out to God, because only God himself can do it. And this is what it says, why it says in the Haggadah, ani velo shaliach. I and not an I and not an angel. Okay, because God Himself had to come and deal with the Egyptians. And I sent forth my hand and I smote the Egyptians. Okay. So God Himself has to deal with the Klipaparo. So when we find this Klipaparo within us, okay. Uh, stopping us doing true right, stopping us putting forward into practice what we know we need to do, then we need to know that it, we have to pray to God because only God himself can handle it for us. Okay? We have to have tremendous faith in two aspects. All right. First, that God can help us. And second of all, he wants to help us. All right. Sometimes, you know, when you get that feeling within you, you're trying and you're falling, you're trying and you're falling. It feels like it's your own fault. OK, we don't realize the forces we're actually up against because the will to receive for self alone is also called a king. It's called the old and foolish king. All right, but it's still king. Bold and foolish king, all right? And so we we um, we we don't realize that we what we're up against. And so we have to ask God. That's when we open our hearts and pray to God to help us. Okay. Well, by Gottlieb says here, sometimes it appears to a person as if he does appear receive help from a shaliach, that is from a friend or from a rabbi. But on this, we say, I uh, don't put my trust in any human created being. I don't put my trust in any uh, sage but only in God himself. When we say that in the book, you know, when we say, um, when we open the ark, okay, and there's Baruch made. I've forgotten how it goes. When you open the ark and there's that whole piece in Aramaic, all right, that's where it's written. Now, we need page three. How are we doing for time? Anybody got any questions while I look for the next page? Call out if you've got a question or if you want to say anything. I was just thinking that the cell phone and all these um, TikToks and whatever they are, that's a, such a, a loud manifestation of receiving for yourself only. It kind of forces you to be alone and you lose track of everything else and everything around you. Yes, that's right. We can get so addicted. Yeah. And even just watching the news, I should break that habit. That's right. No, I've lost the right, I'm sorry, I've got the wrong page here. What page is this? Kofiud Aleph, I need Kofiud Bet. I have got Kofiud Gimel, that's no good. Let's see. There we are. 
light. That's it. Yes, you're hundred percent right. They are so addictive, those things. And that and when people get addicted to them and addiction, it's it's very, very difficult. Oh, one second. Claudia's raised her hand. Yeah, Claudia, what did you want to say? You can unmute yourself. Uh, when you say uh, that uh, we are not judged, we're not being judged for our negative thoughts if we do Teshuvah, right? If we or do Teshuvah? No. I, the, the, okay, right. So, question. You're not judged for your negative thoughts in general, okay? All right. There's one. But don't we have to do Teshuvah or, or repentance? On the thought, that's a good question. Um, probably. Because it's like yes. judgment. You know, if I have a, 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 a thought of judgment, it's, it's negative. It's something I, I should clean and, and, and you know, get rid of this habit of thinking this way i think they're probably correct okay that's a very interesting point when i said we're not judged i meant that as regards to sin it's not called an actual sin if you have a negative thought and then you don't act on it but if you have a thought of your will to receive yourself alone okay and you uh, are like you're 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 putting all your energy on yourself instead of on God. That counts as a negative action, even though it takes place in thought. Okay, but yes, your question is different. Your question is, if and if I have a negative thought which does not lead to action, should I do tshuva on it? I think the answer to that is yes, you should. Because otherwise, if you don't, it'll become a habit to think like that, and then it will lead to an action. So yes, I think I think you're wise, and I think it is correct to do tshuva on that. Yes. Uh, good question. Okay, very good. Okay. All right. ואתה בא נבוא לפרש לכם בעזרת השם יתברך בסורת הגאולה ושליחות משה. Now we're going to explain to you, with the help of God, the message of redemption and the Moses, mes and Moses uh, is uh, uh, שליחות. How do you say שליחות in English? What his um, role was, what God had sent him to do. As it's written, Vian Moshe, Vyomin, Vahen lo yaminuli. And when um, Moses, um, a God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, okay, and he tells Moses to go and tell the children of Israel about the redemption, Moses answered and he said, but they won't believe me. Ki yomu lo Hashem. How do we know that God appeared to you? All right. Perush. Explanation. The kevan shepeh to Kedusha ya begalut. Okay. Since we said the Malkut of Kedusha, the Malkut Shamayim was in exile. Hainu, she'inyan avuda ba'manat nashpiata begalut. The whole issue of doing Torah lishma, of faith in God, of, of loving your fellow as yourself, was all in exile because they couldn't bring it down from the thought into the actual. They couldn't bring fruit out. They couldn't actually do the mitzvot. Because in the inner meaning of heaviness of, of the malkut, uh, uh, heaviness of the mouth and heaviness of the tongue, I am. Okay. So they couldn't bring forth their thought of holiness into any action, all right? 
לכן היה משה רעי מאמונה טוען לפני שהם ברח, then Moses, the, the faithful shepherd, okay, he always took the part of the people, טוען לפני שהם יתברך, he's saying before God, הם לא יאמינו לי, they won't believe me, not in the sense that they'll just dismiss what I'm saying, What they're saying is, even if I manage to connect Israel with me, and I'm able to give them the power of doing some sort of giving, they don't have the power to overcome this klipa of Pharaoh, which is blocking them, and which is taking all their life force. In other words, when Moses says, because he's Raya Mehemana, he's the faithful shepherd. He's not accusing Israel when he says they won't believe me. What he's saying is, it's not going to help, because even if I manage to give them some faith, okay, I'm giving them some, some ability to do giving in faith, they're stuck with this awful klipat paro, which is blocking them completely. All right? And even though they, they do want to be one with me, they won't be able to listen to my voice. Because as long as they're under the governance of this wretched Klipat Paro, okay, and the pair, the Dibor Begalot, and the Malchot, everything to do with bringing into practice is in exile. Nevertheless, they, they, it's in exile, they can't do anything. Nevertheless, Rabbi Ashlag says, however, if they were to believe in the the power of the faith okay they would be able to get out of the of the of the governance of pharaoh why because they would have been able to listen to this to the voice of moses because he's above knowledge is above the aspect of the body faith is of a higher paradigm than knowledge okay pharaoh is acting on the realm of knowledge exile means acting on the realm of knowledge using our will to receive ourselves alone okay remember we started off this article of defining that the aspect of giving for the mind is faith. So if the children of Israel are able to use faith, they will be able to connect with Moses. They will be able to hear what he's saying. Okay. As If they were getting stronger with that, then of course they're going to get saved from the Klippah of Paro. With the power of faith. It's the, because the, the klipa of Pharaoh is not able to govern in an area of faith, only in an area of knowledge. All right? Because the mind's will to receive, like we said earlier, is to control everything through knowledge. But the way of the Yehudi, the way of the Jew, is the way of faith. And this is what Moses, the faithful shepherd, complained to God. And he said, They'll say, God never appeared to you. And what we said earlier, that a new king arose over Egypt, who didn't know Yosef. 
because when they go down into this will to receive for themselves alone, which is considered as idol worship, because they're worshiping themselves instead of God. They will also blaspheme against the greatness of Moses, the faithful shepherd, the greatness of faith. And so Moses says, how can I possibly redeem them from this terrible klipa that we're stuck in? And that's why God gave to um, Moses three signs. That, that Moses will show them to the children of Israel. And, Moses, and God taught Moses to organize these three signs, one after the other. And God promised him he would help him from heaven. That he would manage to show them them. And when the children of Israel would have received these signs, they would be able to listen to what Moses is saying. And then he'll be able to redeem them from their bitter exile. And we've got five more minutes. Hmm. Well, we'll do one. So now Rabbi Ashag is going to explain these three signs. It's our first sign, remember, that Moses was told by God to throw his staff on the ground and it turned into a snake, okay? And the snake started chasing, and the snake started chasing uh, uh, Moses, all right? Okay. The second sign was when he took his hand out from his bosom and he found it was, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and it was all uh, with, with uh, leprosy. And when he put it back, it returned back as his flesh. And the third sign was pouring the water of the Nile onto dry land and it became into blood. So one minute, we've got to find the next page. We said this was... 112, we need 113. Oh, I think I've got it here already. There you go. Okay. So I'll explain to you now how Moses showed them to Israel. This is Rabbi Ashak speaking. Okay. So in the hand of the Redeemer was a, was a stick, was a, was a, you know, a staff, right? Shuhu bechinat hemuna shnika mata bechashivut. And this is the aspect of faith. And faith is it's a play on words, okay? And he calls it, it's, well, don't let's go into the words. Let's just call it, the faith is represented by his staff. All right? Shusod Raya Mahimana. And Moses is called Raya Mahimana, the faithful shepherd. You know, that's actually his um, uh, uh, name that he's called in the Zohar. All right, whenever there's a piece which is channeled by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai from Moshe Rabbeinu, it's labeled Raya Mehemana, the faithful shepherd. So why is he called the faithful shepherd? It wasn't because he looked after sheep, all right, and he was very good at his work. It was because he, he, were, he gave the aspect of faith to the people of Israel. He gave them the ability to have faith. That's what he gave them. That's why he's called Raya Mahimana, the faithful shepherd, because he gave them the ability to use faith. He has the staff in his hand, and he's now a play on words, to incline the heart of Israel to their father who is in heaven. That through the faith of his heart can come to God. And 
But if they throw it down to the ground, peyush, meaning, they take their faith, to use it according to their own will, all right? In other words, they're using their faith only in order to fulfill their will to receive, feel in a hush. It'll turn into a snake. I know, she now said klipa, it becomes a klipa. She near, elehem hata'am kamo ba'alei and their sin appears like something alive. She mi karotem kavulamatehu. Okay, that before they they threw it down to the ground, their sin was something more passive, more uh, like you know inanimate. But when they actually brought their the the mate the faith down to the ground, it's like throwing the staff on the ground. If they bring if they take their faith and use it for their will to receive for themselves alone, it becomes an actual snake. Okay. Veanos Moshemi Panav. Okay. And Moses ran away from it. Okay. That is to say. Um, however, Vachakach, Kesheba Moshe Latzila, Min Shichat Anachash Azeh. But when Moses comes to save them from the bite of this awful, you know, it's even worse. It's like if, if you take faith and you elevate it and you use your faith and you value it, okay, then it's helpful and it's wonderful. But if you take your faith and you try to use it only for the sake of receiving and filling up your egoism, then it's worse than, than if you hadn't touched it. Okay, so Moses comes to save them from the bite of the snake. And what does he do? He catches it by its tail and not by its head. And he says, because a false redeemer, when he comes to save Israel, catches the snake by its head to smash the head of the snake, which is what all snake catchers do. Okay, that is to say, if he comes to nullify the klipa, which is against faith, using his knowledge or using his logic, that's not going to work. He needs to go, actually, not through logic, but through faith himself. So a true redeemer catches it by its tail, okay, that is through faith, not through logic, okay. Goes into all this in a lot of detail. The ilamata mata be a couple, and then it comes back to being a staff in his hand. All right. She has poel be emit, but carefully bam not to tamla kaf sukut, and that way Moses, by showing them how to act in this situation, he says, "Don't try to fight the situation with logic." With rationale, you'll only make things worse. What you need to do is use the situation to go into your faith even greater. All right? Fight the situation with faith, not with logic. So when the children of Israel accept this sign, okay, they now understand how to get out of the servitude through emunah. And it's through faith. In fact, many times the sages tell us the children of Israel came out of Egypt. God rescued them and he gave them faith. And that's how they came forth. All right. That was quite a letter. What do you think? I'll stop sharing there. All right. <laughs> that's one of my favorite letters. I think it's quite really, really amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I think it's one of the most amazing, amazing letters. It really is. Explains the exile, explains Pharaoh, explains how it relates to us today. It's thank you, Hashem. We're so, I mean, it's such a privilege. It's such a privilege to, you know, be able to read a letter that Rabbi Ashlag wrote 80 years ago or something. 
maybe longer, 100 years ago, more or less 100 years ago to his pupils when he was away on a journey and he wrote this to his pupils and we've got the privilege of reading it today. I think it's a miracle. Right. Yeah. And it's so pertinent to what we're going through now. Completely. Completely. I mean, this is what he says. He says that the, he says it's not history. He says it's it's all about how we serve God in the present. It's about us. That's a wonderful story. I really love that letter. Okay, great, wonderful. Thank you. All right, so everybody. Lovely. It was lovely, lovely Thanks. learning with you to everybody today. Have a Thank lovely, you. lovely Shabbat. May. Shalom. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Bye then. Bye. 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 Bye bye. Bye, Ayla. Bye, bye. Shrinza. Bye, Mindy. Bye. Bye bye. I haven't seen bye. you, Ella, for so long. Hi, bye, my love. Bye. I haven't seen you for so long. Oh, yes. No, I miss yeah, you all so much. You you are not back. No, I'm still in the uh, still in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. Hope you come back soon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What can I do? Okay. Never mind. But my my family really really want me to stay here until yeah uh, yeah, and I understand them. I really do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's sort of, you know, you don't really know what's going on up there. But I'm very grateful. I hear that mostly on the on the on, on the whole it's quiet in Sfar, isn't it? You don't have any alarms, do you? No. Oh, we don't. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Did you what neighborhood are you in in, in your shalai? I'm in um uh what's it called? Catamon. Catamon. Okay, because we're um in border between Rechavia and um, oh. so nearby we're just going to be moving very soon to another place oh wow you're in Jerusalem as well I am Gosh. and I'll be staying in the yeah wow and, and you're coming, coming. Oh, hmm? sorry no 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 go ahead sorry and I was just going to say that maybe I come two days next week in case i will let you know if you have time oh i okay you have to let me know in advance all right yeah yeah i'm not sure i just like quick quickly coming and going so anyway yeah okay i said because yeah. i'm actually i'm actually